No censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. And welcome to Headliners. I'm Dominic Frisby, and with me tonight, reviewing tomorrow's papers, we have Nick Dixon and Eric McElroy. But before we let them speak, we go to the news, which tonight is read to you by Tamsin Roberts. Dominic, thank you. Good evening from the GB Newsroom. NATO and G7 leaders are increasing lethal aid to Ukraine. Speaking after emergency meetings in Brussels, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson said military kit will be provided in the quantity and quality needed so the country can defend itself against Russia. Ukraine is not alone. We stand with the people of Kiev, of Mariupol, of Lviv and Donetsk and as President Zelensky has said himself, the people of Ukraine will prevail and Putin must fail and he will fail. The Foreign Secretary says Russia's intelligence agency is behind a calculated and dangerous hacking campaign. Liz Truss says the FSB has targeted UK infrastructure for nearly a decade. The Foreign Office says it's almost certain hackers from the spy agency's Centre 16 are behind cyber attacks in Europe, the Americas and Asia. Ms Truss says it shows President Putin is prepared to risk lies to sow division and confusion around the world. P&O Ferries has admitted breaking the law when it sacked 800 workers without notice last week. Chief Executive Peter Hepplethwaite acknowledged trade unions should have been consulted first when he was questioned by MPs. He also told them the new crews are being paid below the UK's minimum wage on international routes, but he insists it is legal. We thought long and hard about the routes to this, and we did consider every single option available to us and we concluded that every single option available to us would result in the closure of P&O. Self-isolation and mandatory masks in shops and on public transport are to be scrapped in Wales. First Minister Mark Drayford will announce the changes tomorrow and they'll come into effect on Monday. Jurors have been shown footage of the moment the man accused of murdering Sir David Amos was arrested. Prosecutors say 26-year-old Ali Harby Ali stabbed the MP in his constituency in Essex last October. Ali, who denies preparing terrorist acts and murder, was tackled to the ground by two plainclothes officers. Get it down! Right, search him. Right, mate, at the moment you're under arrest yeah, for murder. All right, if you like to say anything, it may on the fence. If you do not mention when mentioned something which you like rather in court, anything you do say may be given as evidence. Do you understand me? TV, online, and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Dominic and Headliners. Thank you, Tamsin. Hello and welcome to Headliners, the show that saves you the chore of reading the papers by having comedians review them for you. I'm Dominic Frisby and tonight my panel may not seem that diverse in terms of race, <laughs> gender or sexuality, but it has a form of diversity rarely seen on television. Diversity of opinion. We have Eric McElroy, who sits mildly to the left of centre, an old-school social democrat, which makes him loony left by today's <laughs> definitions, and beside him sits conservative commentator, or should I say far-right extremist, Nick Dixon. Hello, gentlemen. How yeah, are you both? You, you know, Twitter will take that seriously. That's, yeah. I did the political compass. I was like 1.25% to the right. I'm like a millimetre off a boring centrist. And now Twitter are just going to run you with that know, and say I'm a... Well, you know, anyone to the right of Jeremy Corbyn is far right. Oh, OK, well, then I'm all right. <laughs> well, then I'm on the far right now, so... Uh, yeah. Well, I oh, guess you are. Yeah. Guess, I, well, you're on this show. 
<laughs> so anyway, um, right, that's the uh, mildly amusing pre-show bants <laughs> out of the way. Let us turn our attention to the headlines. And we start, as always, or not as always, but as often, with the Daily Mail, which has a picture of the Queen looking radiant, and alongside that, the headline, Kremlin, Boris is our number one enemy. I'm sure that'll confirm all his inner Churchill biases. We move on to the Telegraph, which also has a picture of the Queen. And Biden, we will respond in kind if Putin uses chemicals. That's a story we'll be covering. And also Sunak branded a fiscal illusionist over tax cut claims. On to the Independent. And there's a picture of two blown up cars and a bombed out city. Welcome to hell. Kim Sengupta reports from a town retaken by Ukraine. There's also half a million children to be plunged into poverty. That's a, another anti-Sunak narrative going on there. We head over to The Guardian. Biden's warning to Putin over chemical weapons. There's also a picture of all the prime ministers, but not Vladimir. And Sunak faces storm over failure to aid poorest. We head over to the FT, which has p &O chief confesses sackings were illegal, but says he would do it again. That's a story we'll be covering. And also a picture of all the uh, leaders uh, there as well. On to the mirror, another picture of the Queen, and shame on you, p &O boss admits firm deliberately broke the law to sack 800 staff. And there's a picture of uh, Rishi and his wife, as 1.3 million are plunged into poverty. What does rich man Rishi know about real life? Well, he knows how to get on, I'll say that much. On to the Times. NATO will act if chemical weapons used, says Biden. And also Sunak's tax cuts set to cost wealthy £3,000 a year. That's a rather different angle from the Times. On to the Express. Why Britain must act to end this despair. Shocking and brutal reality of the hardship endured by so many today. And that's a reference to the cost of living crisis, not to Ukraine. And finally, we have the star, which has good and bad news. It never rains, but it pours. Weather boffs predict we will bask in 30 centigrade heat, then ruin it by telling us to stay safe indoors. Another amusing headline from the star, and those are the headlines. And we start with that Guardian headline, an ominous rhetoric coming from today's NATO summit. Eric. Yes. Yep. Joe Biden is raising the stakes with Russia, saying that NATO would uh, respond with force or, or relative force um, if the Kremlin starts to dip into chemical weapons and other things. And I think um, that, the, that we would retaliate proportionally, whatever that would be, mean. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I think they didn't, they, you know, years ago when Syria used chemical weapons, uh, allegedly Obama drew the red line and then that got pushed back by the British Parliament and the US Congress and didn't get taken. And we should have pushed back then and we should push back now. Uh, an overseas interventionist speaks. Yes. Worrying, worrying. I suppose in a way, the fact that Russia, I mean, you never know quite what the truth is, but the fact that Russia doesn't seem to be doing as well as but as it hoped, yep. means it has to escalate its aggression, which means it goes to chemical, it goes to nuclear. So in a way, that's like almost the worst thing that can happen. But I think that, you know, a lot of people said Putin responds to strength. So I think standing up and saying that there is a red line here because he's a fascist dictator, even slightly further to, to the left, right than Nick is. Um, but uh, but he's somebody who is... Outrageous. I know, but it, you know, it's true. Um, but I think it is something that you have to stand up and be... He understands force. I mean, the guy kills his, his opposition leaders and yeah. he imprisons them. So being like, oh, well, we don't want to take this further. Obviously, the sanctions didn't stop him from going in. We have to say that we will put some teeth behind what we say. Now, Nick, um, before you were a comedian, you were invading innocent countries, busy mm. doing that. What, uh, is this expert. the right way to tackle? You know how to deal. Yes. You know how Putin <laughs> thinks. Yeah. Is this well, the way to deal with it? It's interesting Eric's praising force, because presumably then he would, he would want Trump in, because, of course, if you believe the <laughs> New York Post, Trump basically said, if Putin ever invades Ukraine, I'll bomb Moscow. So he was not subtle about it. Because what, what's interesting here is that there's an official here, unnamed, saying we're remaining deliberately ambiguous. And Boris has also said you need to, uh, a bit of ambiguity about your response. But what's funny is Trump went for the exact opposite. So there's two tactics in there. One is to say, yeah. if you use chemical weapons, 
we may do something, be afraid, we're not going to tell you exactly what it is. And the other one is saying, we'll bomb you, here's a picture of your house, which he did with a, yeah. a, a But Putin didn't need terrorist. to stand up to NATO when Trump was president because Trump was destroying NATO from within. So Putin, he was By doing asking Putin's them work. to pay their fees. No, but, Germany to pay their it. fees. Why is that destroying NATO? John Bolton, who's no friend of the left, has said that he believes that Trump would have pulled the U.S. out of NATO if he'd been re-elected. But, so I'm sure Trump, but Putin was counting. But people who are no friends of Trump have admitted he got Germany to pay their, actually pay up for once. Well, and therefore, you know, take NATO seriously. Yeah, but I think I'm, also, I'm delighted to see the panel have already fallen out. <laughs> there are only one story here. That was quite good knowledge. It was good. Comedian. It was good. I was impressed. Yeah. I, I, was I impressed, shocked myself. We've got a show to do here. Now, it's often hard to know who is actually winning the war in Ukraine, but if you read this story in the mail, Nick, you would say it's almost certainly Ukraine is winning it. Yes, it's in the back. You, it, well, Col, you're right to say that. It's I mean, relative. Yeah. We don't know exactly what's happened, but there is some evidence here. It says Ukraine, Ukraine has destroyed a huge Russian ship just days after state media filmed it unloading reinforcements at a captured port as Putin's army continues to suffer punching losses at the hands of Kiev's men. So they're said to have uh, scored a direct hit on the Orsk, a 370-foot Russian alligator-class tank carrier. You know it's big because it's an alligator class. And a respected naval analyst that said it's beyond reasonable doubt that it has exploded. And this comes after NATO have said Russia lost up to 40,000 men, either killed, wounded or captured. And, and that's the question, of which figures do we believe? But I thought it was also interesting that even Russian media three days ago admitted that 9,861 soldiers died and 16,153 injured. So it does seem like, as you said a moment ago, Russia is doing a little worse than they may have anticipated. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even if you look at this and say, of course, this is our side of things, even if you look at, you know, even Russian state media seemed to let slip that it was quite a few casualties. Yeah, I mean, they quickly took that number down that was on Russian media, that the 9,000 uh, casualties, and that got removed from that website. I think they, people thought it was a mistake that they put up the real number. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it, the narrative we're seeing obviously is slanted because we're getting uh, a Western viewpoint. We're in that bubble, but we also have a broad range of journalists that are there from all spectrums. And um, yeah, seeing a gigantic ship blown up that is part of your forces isn't ideal, especially when you consider Ukraine doesn't even have a navy, I don't think. I remember learning about HMS Hood being blown up and uh, in, I don't even remember if it was World War One or World War II, I've forgotten, but I remember being, feeling uh, mortified by that and that was about 50 years after the event as a, as a schoolboy, but anyway. Um, go Ukraine, right, the Times is next and here we learn the, uh, the rationale of P&O Ferry CEO Peter Hebblethwaite who is paid a basic salary of £325,000. They didn't mention the value of his house, which is what they usually do. But here we learn why he sacked those staff in the way that he did. And uh, this is one of the downsides of globalisation, Eric. Yeah, this is a story from The Times. And basically, he's admitted that um, when he was sacking these folks, because obviously I think everybody knows now that the 800 were laid off under the fire and hire regime, but they were not being rehired because they're bringing in agency workers for a lot less that he was supposed to go to consultancy first with the unions and negotiate this. But he decided, since he knew that the unions would never go for his offer, to forget about it and just skip that step, thus admitting breaking the law, essentially. Um, and he's gone with the policy of uh, ask for forgiveness but not permission, I think is the technical <laughs> policy they call that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of like he, he, he's a man in a divorce who knows he's going to lose the house, so he just decides to burn it down. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right analogy, but, um, but yeah, he... Uh, oh, thanks. No, I was going to say, <laughs> well, you mentioned that analogy as well, because I thought of a, a, a gas-related analogy. Did you see that viral video the other day where the guy was si trying to siphon gas from the other guy's car, yeah. and when he came in and confronted him, he just went, yeah, sorry, man, I apologise. I was trying to steal gas from you. So he's basically gone with it. It was illegal, yeah. yeah. yeah I'd like to see that kind of honesty in the government. Uh, it, would be, it would be good, but it sort of makes him come across as extremely heartless. I'm amazed at how much the replacement work workers are all on like five pounds an hour, yeah. five pounds twenty an what hour. What should take Dom as like a heartless libertarian? Because you've got this, the unions, but you're not probably a union type person, but is it, is it different? Oh, I case? don't mind a union. Okay. I'm, I'm pro-unions in, in theory. It's when unions take control of government that, uh, it's, it's government I don't like. I'm all for <laughs> unions acting in the interests of their workers. But, okay. but yeah, but to throw away the law because you think it might not work is a process you shouldn't really be allowed to do. No, it isn't. And it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's a story. Anyway, I always <laughs> suspected uh, microplastics were getting into our bodies, and this article from The Independent, Nick, seems to confirm it. You know what I mean? You know where you drink stuff out of plastic, and you think some yes, of this is I've going. seen you on the forums, yeah. the yeah. microplastic <laughs> conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, this is in The Independent. Microplastics found in human blood for first time in extremely concerning study 
uh, that's their words, but also potentially mine. Nearly eight in 10 people's blood found to contain plastic particles break through research finds. So, you, you know, I'd heard the human body was mainly water. It turns out it's mainly plastic. Because um, they've been found before in the brain, gut, and placenta of unborn babies and the feces of adults and infants, but never in blood samples. So there's a lot of questions. Will this, do they break through the blood-brain barrier? Uh, is it enough to trigger disease? How do they affect blood cells? And it seems that it's all unknown, but it's not great. <laughs> no, I mean, you can't... I mean, it's just so permanent plastic. You can't break it down, you can't get rid of it. It's not like it's a mineral. Yeah. You know, well, because plastic mineral. is made of oil. So, I mean, it brings it back to the whole issue about the oil debate and our dependency on oil. I mean, that's why we should move to wind and wind farms, and that way our body would be full of wind. You, you, <laughs> if you hadn't saved that comment with the last line, you would never have been allowed on this show again. Right, it seems uh, Jamaica is angling for reparations, Eric, from the royal family. And William and Kate are perhaps rather playing into their hands. This is from The Guardian. Oh, I think that's a loaded way of presenting it that. certainly Just is. a little bit. Um, <laughs> I think there was a thought that maybe Prince William would offer an apology for the historical and factual um, relationship between the crown historically and slavery. Um, but he's, going, he's given his profound sorrow um, for the appalling atrocity of slavery. when he Which was I guess intimate. legally is different. I guess it's different. It's not a full-on apology. Um, I think that, you know, I think historically, since I know Britain did outlaw slave trade at one point in the West, Western Atlantic and all those kind of things, ahead which of was you good. Guys. I'll give you guys the points for that. Um, but they also paid a lot of compensation to the slave traders, so maybe time for some compensation for the actual ancestors of the slaves themselves. I'm sorry. Yeah. Moving on. <laughs> well, it, 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 as you've said, you know, we, we also abolish it. It's, it. We're never going to solve it now. It's a, it's a classic left-right dilemma, but we... One points out on the right that... Not that I'm necessarily on the right, but we, we've gone into that. That we, you know, we had a relatively benign empire compared to many. We did abolish slavery. And I said to someone in the pub the other day, when is Turkey, this is the line I nicked from Douglas Murray, when is Turkey going to apologize for the Ottoman Empire? And they look blank. Everyone talks about our empire and how terrible it was, but no one's talking about these other empires. I think pointing um, to other empires are going, well, they I'm did not saying it's things. great. This doesn't mean we can't own the no, things we that can. America has done historically and that Britain, I've got ancestry in both. And so both empires have done some Which pretty Which is why this things. is good. They've gone over and given some sort of ambiguous apology. <laughs> People are trying to frame them as well. I saw an Al Murray uh, tweet. It was quite funny, but he had a picture of Kate and there was just all these kids through a cage sort of reaching out to oh, it. And it yeah. did look very bad, but then people were quick to point out they shared other photos. It looked a lot nicer, so it does depend on how you want to frame it. So they went over there and put kids in cages, is what you're saying? <laughs> I'm not saying that. You're <laughs> saying that, and it's, it's uh, slanderous, and you will be regulated. You said it. You said, you said, you said. <laughs> right, The Times is next, and Rishi Sunak's photo opportunism seems to have backfired, and I really like this when it happens to politicians, <laughs> it really gives me pleasure because there's, you know, the, the, the photo is such BS and when it backfires, it's good. Oh, really? You're, you're much more vehement than me on this time. I'm, I'm just really a nice guy. But, but Sunak <laughs> borrowed workers' car for photo op, but he did pay for the fuel. So what happened was Sunak was filling up with, he, well, he borrowed a car off the, the employee at the supermarket at Sainsbury's and pretended to be filling up his, no one really thought, Sunak had a Kia Rio, did they? I mean, he has a Jaguar. He, but he sort of did this. He sort of had this photo of his him like looking meaningfully into the distance. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Just thinking about the hardships of his life, five foot six, while and... filling up his Kia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it is silly because he, of course, the people have said, "Look, he has a Jaguar," and uh, and everyone criticised him. And it also came after this thing that he was quizzed about bread the other day. Did he know how much the price of bread was, or which bread was in his house? He had a sort of very vague understanding of the bread that was in his house. But he has got a very important, difficult job to do. So I don't, I don't necessarily need him to be up on all these things. But I will point out it's that... It's quite a good... Go on. One more thing, that Margaret Thatcher, of course, was famous for always knowing the price of a pint of milk, but she was a very special and great person, as Eric will, will acknowledge. I imagine Rishi's driven everywhere, and so he probably doesn't have to fill up his own car, but this is a moment, and I think we're going to be able to show you a clip of this moment, is Rishi attempting to pay for the petrol <laughs> afterwards <laughs> and not really knowing where to put his um, contactless card. Are we going to be able to show this? Be an oh, he's so here we go. You could tell that they, ju they just said, walk in now, yeah. and Gre then he walked in. Greetings, fellow human. And here we go, human. and here he goes. He puts the card to the wrong machine, and the guys are saying, no, 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 that's the Coke, and that's where... And you put your card... No, that's the wrong machine, Rishi. That's the machine you put your oh, card in. Uh, OK, I shouldn't have defended him. That's worse than I thought. It, it, it's pretty bad when a Chancellor can't... Yeah. Work the, and uh, this is money, you say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's outrageous. I think um, George H.W. Bush had a similar thing when he tried to buy something in a shop once and he hadn't been in a store for so long. He was like, you've got electronic tills. 
So there we go. We're showing it again. You, he's, and he was overwhelmed. He's still looking where to sign his signature, isn't he? That, um, that is OK, shocking. we've seen... Well, let's show it again. <laughs> there we go. There's nothing like repeating it if it's, it if it's uh, slandering the Chancellor because... or slagging off the Chancellor. Right. Uh, uh, OK, right. <laughs> we've reached the end of part one. It's all going to kick off in part two. Mm. You do not want to miss it. We will see you in a moment. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Headliners. I'm Dominic Frisby and with me tonight looking through tomorrow's papers or today's papers if you're watching the early morning repeat. We have pathetic liberal Eric McElroy and alt-right fascist Nick Dixon. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an unusual story from tomorrow's Metro. Unusual in that it's about this show. And some people aren't very happy about the way Leo and Simon, that's Leo Kirst and Simon Evans, covered the Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe story. Nick. Yes, well, this, this is a brilliant story for us to be covering as we're all narcissists here. It's about us. So Victoria Coran Mitchell clashes with GB News panelists over racist Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe comments. The programme looked S word. So this is a yes. Yeah, so what happened was Leo and Simon Evans and Diane Spencer were talking about Naznin the other night. Leo made a joke. He said uh, he said hey, you're going you're to read it. I can if you like. Naznin Zagari Ratcliffe is Iranian for ungrateful. Perfectly serviceable joke. Did you make me read that? So now everyone's no, no. going to watch it. Uh, <laughs> you for saying the joke. Look like you wanted to. Me you're it. Gonna no, get... I was just going to get the wording right. Okay, that was all. But yeah. That's very important. It's a decent yeah. joke. It's not Nick Dixon level, but it's a good joke. It's uh, <laughs> and uh, this caused all kinds of problems because Victoria Coran Mitchell decided this was racist. She she then uh, she 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 shared the clip and she said. If this stumbly, cackling, racist incompetence is what GB News puts out as a trailer, what on earth is the rest of it like? She doesn't know because, like most of our critics, she hasn't watched the channel. But, um, yes, yeah, so, so then this kicked I off... I think you do get virtue... Like, it's a way of getting virtue points online is slagging off GB News. It's like an easy way of getting virtue points, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And, and it's, quite, it's a bit unclear why they hate it so much. I mean, David Mitchell's already written a whole Guardian article about it, oh. and now Victoria Corrin Mitchell, they're both as attacked us on Twitter, and they're both, it seems to live rent-free in their heads, to use that expression. And we're just this lowly, terrible channel, so I don't know why they're so bothered. Anyway, so then Leo inevitably defended himself against the accusation of racism, which is a terrible accusation to make against someone, and... It was a very strange response from Cara Mitchell. She, he said, can you say what is racist about it? And she said, well, that's beyond my powers. Seemingly to say that because she's white, this is my interpretation, she couldn't possibly 
say what's racist about it, but it is definitively racist. That was her stance. And then she said, and you'd only argue back anyway, as if it was silly that Leo would defend himself against the, you know, a libelous accusation. So she hit back with that, and then and it's all gone on from there. I've defended Leo. I think Leo. it's a default reaction, is when, a, when people on, you know, the other side of the culture war, if you like, hear an opinion they don't like, a default reaction is to go, that's racist. Yes. And, and once she said that, she's got to defend it. Yeah. I'm, and that's I'm, where she's got herself into trouble, because she's written this sort of 20... It's like the longest thread in the history of Twitter, in her own admission, boring. <laughs> I mean, it's unreadable. Yes. And, sorry, no, you're, it's, you're, it, I, I'm, I'm desperate to speak. I'm des well, I'm not desperate, it's just it's, it's, such a, it's been a big thing today. She... Yeah, because cause she said initially she couldn't defend it, then when Leo sort of pressed a bit more on the point, she then did in the long, boring thread, as you put it. And, yeah, she made such... No, she put it, not me. Uh, she put it, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and she said such... She said things like... So then Leo compared uh, Nazanin to Mar Meghan Markle and made a joke about that on, on, twi on Twitter. And she was... A very fascinating thing from Cora Mitchell here. She says, that was a bit rum, but I assume you think you'd make exactly the same comparison if they were both white. I reckon you wouldn't. So it's the mind-reading accusation of racism. She says Leo wouldn't make that comparison. Of course, he definitely would, because the joke is about ingratitude. It's about perceived ingratitude. Yeah. Megan is like Nazanin because they're both ungrateful, is Leo's joke. Nothing to do with race. As I said in my tweet, you can read my tweet thread, Nick Dixon comment, but basically, <laughs> it's nothing to do with race. <laughs> Uh, she also, Your Corrin, follower account's going to go up by three. Thank you. Cora Mitchell also yeah. said that the, the language is not Iranian, it's Farsi. But, of course, that wouldn't work very well in a joke. One, because people don't necessarily know that. Also, it's just funny to say the Iranian for it sounds a bit dumb. Leo's taking on a bit of a persona. It's broad. It's broad country yes. humour, you know. Um, yeah. I, I think, for me, the glorious thing about it was uh, Leo's sign-off at the very end of it. Anyway, I'm getting married tomorrow and my best man's Iranian. I know, that was amazing. <laughs> I don't know, probably That's true. Darius, but I don't want to... I've got more points, but I think I'm, I'm let Eric speak, so we should let Eric come back. If you want to come well, back with the opposite it, side. This is very much a being John Malkovich moment where it's a show about the news talking about itself. I, yeah. I feel like there's levels here that I are so meta, I don't even know what to say. I mean, Leo was trying to make a joke. He pointed out it wasn't racist because um, Iran is a country, not a nation. So if he, he was being more xenophobic than racist, I guess if I was defending him and saying that. But I'm not going to pick on a man for telling a joke on the day before his wedding. No, but let's let's just be fair, Eric. If it was, let's say, let's say it was a poll... It isn't even xenophobic. No, no, it's, it's not xenophobic. Well, no, but if, if you're not being... If you're making fun of a cultural thing, then that would be the it doesn't argument. doesn't necessarily make, mean you're xenophobic. I think it, more I than of being racist. You and I make fun of Americans. It's but a I'm linguistic not, joke. And, like all, and I always take it personally and then tweet about it in long threads. Look, he's desperately I, sorry. He's trying to get I'm in. Trying to, well, I'm sorry. It's a simple linguistic formula. It, 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 he would do it if it was a Polish name. He would do it if anything. The joke is simply the name means ungrateful. It, yes. it, it's nothing to do with any. Because she had the audacity to question why she was left to rot in Iran for years. Well, that's that's a separate thing. Whether you think it was an um, you know unfair yeah. opinion, but it was just an opinion about one person in joke form. That's all it was, and it, it, it's. She wrote this long thing, perhaps because Leo mentioned lawyers, perhaps she had a pang of conscience and just realised it's unfair to smear someone. And what was very interesting, lastly, if, you, if we have to move on, is that she defended Jimmy Carr very recently. He made a joke that was much more offensive, the, you know, the, the travelling mm. joke, famously. And she defended Jimmy Carr, so really it's just... Joke people I like, their jokes are good. Leo, bad, because he's on GB News. It's not more complicated than that, in my opinion. OK. Right, we have got to the bottom of that and we turn to the mail next. And a kind of similar story, I suppose, Graham Linehan, um, who broke down on the BBC's Nolan uh, show at being effectively cancelled. And it, it's hard not to feel some sympathy for Linehan, albeit with some butt. Yeah, there's possibly some butts in there. I mean, I hadn't been up on what has happened to him as far as him diving into this issue of um, the trans debate, if you want to call it that, where statements that he's made have been taken to be considered uh, derogatory or hateful towards groups of people. Um, I mean, I always find it interesting, you know, he was obviously very upset, and I don't want to minimize that, but to see someone saying that they are um, cancelled, but doing so on a nationally broadcast news program once again, um, I wish I could yeah, get no, cancelled. Hat -trick, that hat -trick have said to him if they want to if they're going to make the father ted musical which is already scripted the music's yeah. been written that um, he had become that basically his association with it yeah. had meant that he needed to remove himself from it so i mean that is i mean that when you get into the definitions of canceled losing income from that probably does fall under that umbrella um i mean he's saying that no one will come to his defense I haven't seen the kinds of things that he said, so I can't say whether they're yeah. defensible or not. But he also gets into a long part of the article, in the, this is in the Daily Mail, saying that, no, you know, his comedian friends won't come to defend him um, at all. But, again, I, I feel like if 
people can. Uh, I, I think you know, the fear he's of defending something. a classic example of the dangers of spending too long on social media because he's yeah. just on it all the time. I followed him for a bit. I had to unfollow him because all my Twitter feed was was Graham Linnan, and he's an example of that. And I, you know, I have to say, I really do feel sorry for him in this instance. I but he massively trolled me once. Mm. You know, I, I did a crappy interview on Sky once that I hadn't properly prepared for. And then, because um, I thought I was promoting my Edinburgh show, and then I was thrown a question out of left field that I wasn't expecting. And they just put the clip oh. of the bit when I was thrown the question. And then loads of people, and then he was like all over it and like, look at this idiot. It was all in, the, in an argument about Brexit. And I remember thinking, that's a really nasty thing to do by him. So... I sort of have sympathy, but at the same time, a little bit of shade and Freud. Yeah, and it, but you have to also realise he's, he's, he's had a conversion. He's seen the light because he used to do those things. He attacked Dankula, who went to prison, for, or it was fined, whatever, for that, for that joke. He attacked Count Dankula and then later apologised and said, I would like okay. to apologise further. I didn't know that. He's having been through this experience, because he's been red pilled by the fact that you know, by the way people have treated him, and that will happen to more and more people because okay. when they're treated so nastily by the woke left, whatever you want to call them, and I, I'm, I'm, most, I'm surprised Eric's trying to minimise it because for some reason the left doesn't want to admit cancel culture exists. And my only conclusion on that is they must think it's too useful a tool for them that tends to work in their favour because it definitely <laughs> does exist. And that's my only Man, pos I, possible I've conclusion. I've lost a whole show once upon a time, Virgin Podcast, by being, by, because of a guy writing an article in The Guardian, why is the, yeah. why is, um, it exists. Richard but Branson got it... this bloke on his show and we lost it. I wrote a whole article about this for free market okay, conservatives, let's, if let's, you want to. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> why always when I plug my thing? Oh, go on, plug your <laughs> thing. No, 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 I'm joking, I'm just, it's fine. I, I, I'm going to plug my show next so week. It's so that you've got articles right. about it. Um, the Guardian is next, and Eric, when graphic design goes wrong. Yes, I, I mean, these are, I mean, it's obviously set in the contrast of a terrible situation, but it is humorous. In The Guardian, Akado, the delivery service, had redesigned their logo um, uh, with their new brand called Zoom, which I think that name's already been taken, yeah. their delivery service, but um, they, they focused on the Z in Zoom. Z, I'm going to say Z, Z because Z. Uh, it just goes better. I'm gonna, You're in England I now. I, would say that. <laughs> I, I do say Z when I'm that talking to my That makes me a xenophobe kids. for saying that. Um, <laughs> but the Z design, looks a lot like the quote-unquote zwastika of the Z that's on the Russian tanks. And so uh, marketing ideas clashing with war, never a good mix. I guess it's kind of like the new Coke of design. If that was, a, was that a flop here in the UK, new Coke, as much as it was in America when they brought that out many, many years ago? I don't know. Oh, well. We but, didn't um, even register here. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's ah, kind of we like... We can see. Should we take we a look at the... We can see the look at the, um, ZZ. The, there we go. It's, it's very does, expensive. We shouldn't show that, really. It does look like it should be on it's a Russian tank. It's pretty generic. It's very Zorro. Can, can you know, say, timing. It, it, it's not quite the same level as IBM and Hugo Boss actually working with the Nazis, is it? It's not like uh, Ocado are delivering... I don't think they're, do, yeah. they're not delivering avocados <laughs> to the Russian front line. They've got a Z that looks a little bit like another Z. It's a bit o overblown. Also, we should say, I know this is the, the swastika, but the swastika itself was, of course, appropriated from Buddhism and stuff, yeah. wasn't it? So even... That, but, but who people, owns it? Oh, it was Hinduism. But, I mean, Hinduism people, and Buddhism, apparently, but, and but, Jainism. Uh, but but the people who get that tattoo Wikipedia. and then try and hippies that have the, the swastika tattoo say, oh, no, it's a Hindu symbol. Right. Not in the West, it isn't. So no. I think that's the problem. Although the Russians could probably use the kind of delivery services Okada provide at this stage. I'm sure they could. Right, the Telegraph is next. And Parkrun has banned dog harnesses. They're <laughs> citing safety, but word is the real reason is cheating, Nick. Absolutely. <laughs> it's a big story. Parkrun bans dog harnesses amid claims joggers get an unfair advantage. So bizarre new rule introduced after rumours that participants get assistance from being dragged along by their pets. So the accusations, they use these harness and the dog essentially pulls them along like a husky and they're the human sled being pulled along by their dog and it's making it very easy for them. Other people have said this is absurd and said it goes against the ethos and integrity of Parkrun. And so this guy, um, Kevin Ward, has, for a former run director, has formed the rival Bark Run group Nice. Which is a great idea and potential lawsuit. It's a, <laughs> it's a new thing. You can bring your dog to Bark Run, and Bark Run's already kicking off, and there's thousands of people on their Facebook already. And it's an hour before Park Run, running the exact same route. So it's heavy. They'll leave all the pups, all the dog pups <laughs> in the park. <laughs> exactly. The dog. But the accusation, to be fair, was that the harness dogs, the dogs like, go across the paths of the other runners. So they've changed it so you now can only have a short lead and hold the dog to, your, to the side like that. So it's, I do have some sympathy for that because when dogs are straying off and you're tripping over leads while you're trying to concentrate on running, it's it's nightmare. Not... Yeah, there's no way as a dog owner that running with my dog would be an advantage um, because <laughs> I mean they stop, they just stop. I mean when it's time to go, as you said, to leave yeah. a, a little treat. 
um, there's no way you're going to continue running at that point. It's not just Irish sitcom writers who get cancelled. So do oligarchs' daughters, Eric. This is from The Sun. Hopefully this is the kind of cancel culture that can bring us all together on the show, <laughs> which has taken this poor stepdaughter of the foreign minister of Russia, Sergei Lavrov, his uh, stepdaughter, Polina Kovaleva, 26, single, I believe. Oh. Um, it doesn't look that. <laughs> Um, but it's the sun, so it might. Um, but she's now been sanctioned. She's lost access to her 4.4 million pound flat. And I really feel for her. Um, but I, I mean, I don't, of course. I mean, I think that people who have um, family connections and money that they're making in Russia at this time, whether you're the daughter of a Russian foreign minister or the wife of the chancellor of the exchequer, you shouldn't be making profits in Russia but right now. But can I just say, she, she did Big do- news. She did been news. She did get somewhere by her own endeavor, because I was quite impressed to see she got a first class degree in economics with politics. But then I saw it was from Loughborough University. I know. So let's all calm down. But uh, just kidding, Loughborough. But yeah, I mean, I've heard it said that to some of these. My cousin went to Loughborough. It's a very good university. It's a great it's university best in sport. For, for sport. Yeah, <laughs> it's. I'm, look, it is. It's. It, it, look, I, I've heard that this thing the oligarchs actually see some of these sanctions as a badge of honor, but presumably there is a limit to where they, then they just become annoying. You know, they, they've all got them. They're like, what? You haven't even got sanctions, bro. What a loser. So they, yeah. I've heard that, but presumably there's a point where also, you know, you'd rather not have them. I I'm wonder if it's sure. as annoying as stealing all the wealth from all those Russians over the years and, you know, impoverishing the country. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's a good question. I'm not, not that I'm backing the Russian oligarchs, just FYI. You think you are there, Nick. I'd, 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 love to have, I'd love to dwell on another squabble, <laughs> but we're going to take a quick break now. Join us for part three, which is when we cover all the weird stories. In the meantime, watch the adverts, be mesmerised by the things, and we'll see you in a moment. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Headliners. I'm Dominic Frisby. With me are Eric McElroy and Nick Dixon. We've got a let to, lot to get through, so let's crack on. The mail is next, and it turns out the evil computer genius was a 16-year-old autistic boy from Oxford. <laughs> yes, indeed. Aut autistic English boy 16 is thought to be the mastermind behind Lapsus hack of cybersecurity firms Okta, Microsoft and NVIDIA and now has a net worth of $14 million. And his dad says, I just thought he was playing games. And he, if this was a movie, he would say he was. Dangerous games. And now he's... Uh, <laughs> and it is sort of like a movie story. You've got this mastermind autistic genius in Oxford doing these massive hacks. And it's sort of like, it's almost a bit of an X-Men vibe to it. And yeah, and they've... So he, the people, some, they can't identify who it is exactly because he's a minor. But they've been arrested and, uh, and released pending the uh, outcome of the investigation. And they just said, his dad basically said he was really good at computers. 
we didn't know he was doing this, and we're going to try and stop him going on computers, which I don't think will work. I think you've got to use the powers for good, like in Goodwill Hunting. At the end, you know, you've got to get him doing something good with computers, because obviously well, maybe taking down Microsoft is a good thing. <laughs> well, that, yeah, I could see the angle. I'm, I'm not going to say either way because of Ofcom regulations, but you can say it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't say Ofcom. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I don't like to, you know, talk about Donald Trump being right about something, but he did say that maybe, you know, it was some kid in the basement doing all the hacking and stealing emails and things, and maybe this was the kid all along. Trump I think, right again. I think Eric computer McElroy. code, you yes. know how a lot of mathematicians like peak at 2021, the mathematical brain, and the computer coding brain and the mathematical brain, it's, they're very similar. And a lot of coders, you know, sort of reach their zenith very young mm. in life. It's not, it's not uncommon. I mm. peaked young too. Eric, this is from the mail. Now, yes. this is the question I love to ask you. Oh. What do vitamin D supplements and COVID vaccines have in common? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's loaded. The science has looked at them, has found one ineffective and one very effective. I said, what do they have in common? <laughs> <laughs> um, vitamin D supplements uh, do not stop you from catching COVID, apparently, um, or reducing symptoms. Um, uh, major trial reveals, uh, but um, it apparently doesn't help you with the common co cold either. So I guess that means all that homeopathy I've been doing to stay safe is going to have to. No more little arnica tablets for me mm. of the distilled essence of arnica. Um, but they did a study of 6,200 people from Does Queen arnica Mary. Does arnica have vitamin D in it? <laughs> well, not just homeopathy oh, in I general. Being, oh, I see. Being imaginary essences of health, but. Um, I mean, the professor was looking for a more positive outcome. He said we were surprised and disappointed by the outcome of their study. So they wanted to say that vitamin D was helping with COVID, mm -hmm. but according to the study, it was not. What it intrigued me about the article is that, that vitamin D is not technically a vitamin. It's yes. actually a hormone. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's all about branding. Yeah, I don't know at what point they came out with that and realized vitamin D is yeah. easier to take and more acceptable if it's not a hormone. But they are saying there's quite a lot of suggestive evidence. It's just they haven't been approved. We, you cannot, there's hardly any things you can actually prove definitively in science. It's very hard, isn't it? It, it, it seems like gonna do, they're going to do more studies because they're saying the people who get the most severe disease look exactly like the people who are at highest risk of vitamin D deficiency. So they still believe there may be some link. I don't think it's totally conclusive. But I also think it's good to take vitamin D. I also D. think COVID is worse when it's cold which might be related to the sun, which is related to vitamin D. Yeah, you like should... The, the, the winter is worse than the summer. And we shouldn't discourage people from taking it because people are deficient anyway, which isn't good. We were once, I was once working at a weird startup in Old Street where they, they got us to do a, a blood test as a sort of perk. And it came, it came back that everyone in the office, obviously I had very high testosterone, but everyone in the office had <laughs> incredibly low vitamin D because we're in England. Yeah, it's not just that we're in England. It's we're indoors all the time. We're not yes. meant to be indoors as much as we are. And I, I think it's a... I think we need much more sun in our lives. That's what I'm forever trying to impress on my daughter anyway. Right, an update on a story we covered yesterday, that of bare-knuckle fighter Big Willie's colossal grave in Sheffield. Nick, this is from the... Yes, Big Willie Collins, which I think we can say within Ofcom regulations. I don't know what you said about it yesterday, but it's uh, Travelling King William... Co Traveller King William Collins' family vowed to fight death uh, threats, sorry, to de demolish UK's biggest gravestone a security guard. So basically what happened is he died on holiday in Mallorca. They made a massive grave for him, which includes uh, depictions of Jesus and a, a, a solar-powered jukebox. And, uh, that plays his favourite songs which repetitively is awesome. in a graveyard. Yeah, but... very, pretty cool idea. And, uh, and now the council <laughs> want to take it down because they say it doesn't meet some sort of regulation or other. I say keep it up. I say it's a great tradition of fighters. I say it's a very brave person that will try and take it down if you've got uh, travelling fighters guarding it or security guards. And, you know, the travelling fighters, they've done... It's a great fighting tradition in the travel community. They've given us Tyson Fury, Billy Joe Saunders, these great boxers. I say let them have this massive grave with the jukebox. Can you imagine having your gravestone next to this thing, though? Yeah. I mean, it is... The pictures of it are... It's an honour. No, an honor. you're lying there dead and you're banging on the you're grave next door going, turn then, it down. And trying to but, put different songs on the jukebox. It's got a jukebox. I think they've crossed the line. But I, I'm not going to argue with them because... I understand I don't them mourning their, the their loved one and their hero and their king, but I think some consideration for the neighbours. Just a little also. bit. Perhaps in order, but I'm, I'm not there, so my finger's not on the pulse. Right, the <laughs> mail is next. And here's an interesting story, drone superhighways. This sounds yeah. very ominous. It's Project Skyway mm. coming to bring drones to the 165-mile journey between the Midlands and the Southeast. Um, basically, this is the idea um, that this, this highway in the sky could be built that has all these drones going back and forth delivering 
Amazon packages, I suppose. What else would they be delivering? Um, I mean, I can't imagine living next to it, though. If you're next to this zone superhighway, it'd be like living in a beehive, I would imagine, just from the sound yeah. constantly going. And, you know, you can imagine the people who don't trust 5G, what they're going to think of the drone superhighway out there. Um, I liked one quote in the story. It said, drones have the potential to transport goods in a way our ancestors could never have managed to understand or uh, understood, which, well, yeah. I think I would imagine one, of the, so. one of the problems with drones, it's one of those technologies that enables, like, for example, if you want to bring down the, if you wanted to con conquer a country, you'd have to buy a tank or you'd have to buy a plane. Mm. That's not accessible to an ordinary person. In America. A, yeah. Well, but, but a drone is, you know, a drone yeah. is two or $300. You could probably um, 3D print one. And, you know, there is all sorts of terrorism you can get up to with drone activities. Ca you can just send a drone in, chemi carry chemical weapons. There's, it's, it opens up, it, it weaponizes, it's a weapon that's a, that has yeah. mass You've availability. You've thought about this a lot. You're saying it's democratized violent revolutions in a sense. Potentially, I, I, it's not quite how I'd work, <laughs> but we're in the same direction. Right, um, more cool tech next, but on a slightly larger scale. The doomsday pla plane that can withstand nuclear blasts. It's been flying over the English Channel, Nick. Yes, and it's worth 150 million. This is a, a fascinating and worrying story. A Boeing 747 Nightwatch aircraft, also known as a doomsday plane, has flown over the English Channel. It's uh, designed in the Cold War, and it's known as the Flying Pentagon. And it can, because it has the key, you know, Biden and the rest on it, it can stay for 12 hours in the air, have a crew of 112 people, and it's staffed with uh, military analysts, strategists. Only and... 12 hours? I thought it could stay longer. Yeah, it's a air... so airborne for two, 12 hours, but yeah, then it, I, I think somewhere it said something about two days, didn't it? But the key part for me is that it's Biden's on it. And I've just got this idea of, like, if, this, if there was a nuclear apocalypse, you'd just have Biden flying around in the air with Kamala Harris, and it'd be up to them. Up. Yeah, up to them to sort of repopulate the Earth. I don't want to go into that in too much detail. <laughs> Kamala. You know, uh, because of Ofcom. But, it, yes, exactly. I mean, Kamala Harris is her name. Oh, sorry. Um, but uh, I don't think Biden was on this particular... I'm glad it's here, because... So, I'm is that how he's gone to the... Maybe he went... No, I don't think It Biden would guide him... No, no, it's saying in theory, on. my point is it, it would could. guide Biden yeah. through the first days of a nuclear war. Uh, yes. So this would be flying around with Biden on it, talking rubbish. I've but got the impression he'd flown to the NATO He meeting. would be on Air Force One. This would be the military apparatus going around flying to support him, I think is the idea behind the plane. Oh, I based see. Based on my understanding of well, it. Okay. But I'm glad it's here because I'm planning to fly to the States next week. So if you're going to fly to the States, this is the plane to do it when you've got Russia knocking stuff around. I'll say, right, The Guardian is next. That always makes me suspicious. But according to a recent report by the National Trust, 80% <laughs> of traditional orchards have disappeared since 1900. That's very sad. It is a story about orchards, because I sometimes speed read things, and my wife has criticized me for this, and so I read this as orchids, which I was almost ready to say live on the show. Um, but yes, there's there's fewer orchards around, and obviously that's not a good thing, because they you know provide uh, places for bees. We need bees. Um, obviously, they provide uh, oxygen as well, So they and they're beautiful to look at and all that kind of thing, so I think Having and having trees and having green areas is really important. And also, a lot of these would be apple orchards. And without an apple tree, we wouldn't even have gravity. So it's an important thing. There'd be no gravity true. whatsoever. Um, the interesting thing is they blame farming and urbanization. Yeah, which makes sense. Yeah, I used to live, in fact, once upon a time, I used to live in a house which was in a former orchard. Mm. The, the, the Earl's Field in southwest London, you know, yeah. the Earl's Field, and it's all was all apple orchards once upon a time, but not anymore. Right, uh, on to the male and dolphins whistle as part of male bonding. They also rely on wingmen when trying to secure the attention of mates. Yes, wingmen should be fin men, really, shouldn't it, Don? Am I right? <laughs> You're right. Um, is this even on? I, uh, <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, dolphins, they'll whistle, they'll use wingmen, uh, they'll work together to compete with rival groups over access to females, with the most popular males in the group having the best mating success, typical. And uh, basically, they're able, yeah, so they use these high-pitched vocal exchanges with other males as a low-cost way to maintain their alliances rather than physical bonding activities. So it's another one of these dolphins are a bit like human story with more of an emphasis on whistling. <laughs> that was my basic take Another on. Another one of those stories about yeah. dolphins being like people. <laughs> yeah. oh. I'm sick of them. Well, pretty soon we have to be debating dolphins. As, I find it uh, interesting that, that all the studies had gone on in Bristol, which isn't an, an area you typically associate with dolphins. You'd think it would have gone on 
Maybe that's why they pushed that statue in the waters, because they wanted the dolphins to look at it. Mm. The Colson statue? Yeah. You're saying dolphins are racist? No, they just like statues. Okay. Right, let's move on to another story. And um, this one is very dubious, but we stay with the mail. <laughs> and um, a new study has shown that people who consider themselves lucky are more likely to describe themselves as happy. Did we really need a study to tell us that? Do you feel lucky? Um, I don't know if you've, well, it depends on your levels of fate. So I want to make sure I get this right. So research at the University of, of Bath, should I say that? Bath. 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 Bath um, have revealed that people who believe that luck is a random external phenomenon are more likely to be anxious and neurotic. I'm going to. No. Okay. No, no, um, however, people who consider themselves lucky in terms of their personal circumstances are more likely to describe themselves as happy. So, yeah, did right. we need a study to tell us that? I know it's ridiculous. Oh. Obviously, you're going to lack agency if you think luck is a random external phenomenon. What you should do is live in the present and believe in God. Can I just say that my favourite bit was uh, it says, "Meanwhile, conscientious people are unlikely to enjoy rage against the machine." Obviously, because they're pro-vax sellouts. <laughs> you remember when they made it a vaccine mandatory to do their show, and everyone yeah. was like, "Total sellouts." Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sellout yeah. To science. But they do. Yeah, they've they've, they've studied all these songs. Uh, yeah. sh um, Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, uh, agreeable people tend to like that. Yeah, I like it. It's a good song. Yeah, it's a great song. Um, so that makes me agreeable. Or Bradley Cooper's Shallow. What's Shallow? Yeah. I, that's I why I didn't talk about the songs, because I have no musical knowledge. I love this whatsoever. one. Nirvana fans are likely to be no, more New York. Yes, yeah. I think I, I could have guessed that. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest when Nirvana was coming up, and yeah, I agree with that. And then here's the humdinger. In the study, the researchers studied 844 students in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> Do they feel lucky in Hong Kong right now? Well, I don't. I don't think I they. Don't this, um, this, I think we can say that the study is debunked. Right, <laughs> the star is next, and we get very high brows <sighs> on this show. Apparently, and I apologise to the more sensitive viewers, apparently farts smell worse in the shower. Why is this? Yeah. Um, we, I'm not sure why they're giving it to me, because my brand is very highbrow, but one of the producers thinks it's funny. So, farts do smell worse in the shower, says expert, but it's, it's you, not them. So, the idea is they smell worse in the shower because of uh, three reasons. One, you're naked, so there's no clothing to block uh, the fart, you see, yeah. uh, which you can imagine. And then you're in an enclosed space, unless you've got a massive shower if you're very wealthy. And uh, the steam will also enhance the sense of smell. So if anyone was wondering about this, which I wasn't, that is the, those are the three main points there. I do want to test this out now. It's all but your own fart. I mean, the old joke is, you know, farts are like children. Your own are lovely, but everyone else <laughs> is horrible. And, and uh, um, I sort of think that applies here. Great stat for you guys and to anyone at home. People normally fart around 15 times per day Though this can vary between <laughs> three and forty, depending on your diet, never less than three. Yeah, ah. three is three seems pretty good to me. I mean, that's some, that's a great diet if, if it's only three, don't you think? I don't. I don't fart. Okay, I need the why, but I'm saying it. Yeah, one imagines. And if I did, it'd be like liberal roses of freedom and. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the Left wrong channel for fart. that. <laughs> <laughs> right, so we move on to our final story, which is. Well, uh, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin in Thailand. There's a lot of um, Bitcoiners in Thailand, as it happens. Uh, I know a lot of digital nomads live out there. But the Times reports that Thailand is clamping down on cryptocurrencies. Yes. And the only reason to cover this story is surely to hear you, Eric, attempt to pronounce the name of the governor of the Bank of Thailand. I wasn't even going to go near it because it's got about every single... I mean, it would not fit in a wordle, let's put it that way. It is a very long name. Um, can but, you do it, Don? Because you wouldn't normally ask unless you could... Well, do it. Yeah. I'm looking at it and I don't know if I can. You've Sethaput Suthiwat Nariput. That is correct. Is well right? done. If that is exactly that wrong, how to do it. There'll be a long thread from Victoria Corrin Mitchell tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Why you're a racist? Suthi um, Wart Naruput. Yeah. I yeah. So. I think that sounds good. I mean, basically, what we're saying is, I mean, uh, along with other imaginary currencies, they're banning them in Thailand. Um, and I can see and why. And the dollar is not an imaginary if, currency. What well, is the dollar I, based on, Eric? The, the gold standard. I, don't, I know it's not. <clears> so I'm, I'm kidding. Um, Bitcoin so prices um, have been going up apparently because of this. And um, but yeah, they're trying to outlaw some cryptocurrency payments. But I would think in Thailand, you'd want some untraceable money for some of the things people might be going there for. 
Oh, what slander. It's a glorious and beautiful country. <laughs> um, do you, have you bought your bitcoins yet? Nick? Oh, yeah, I bought it at quite a reasonable time. I bought it when it was like 5,000, which would put me in quite good stead, but I didn't have enough money to make a sizable investment. So okay. it, it was token, really, a token effort. But, but you're still in the money. I got in at, a, well, I was, you know, not the very start where I'm going to be massively rich, but where I was still quite quite shrewd. How about, I mean, what's, how about you, Dom? You're the king of Bitcoin, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, well, I, I, I was in very early and I wrote the book about it, but then unfortunately all mine got nicked in about 2015, so I never became... Did you not have it in one of those external wallets, like buried I do now, the ground? I didn't back then. Uh, it's a endorsement of health. Yeah, oh, boy, but I'll tell you what, safety. more significantly, and it's not a story we've covered today, but Russia is making noises about selling its natural gas and its petrol for Bitcoin. Mm. And that is a very significant development geopolitically, more so than what's going on in Thailand. Did you? And <laughs> so you the say. other big development today, if you're interested, is Esso, the oil magnate. You know when you um, uh, have oil wells, you have gas flaring. Mm. And they burn the the. It seems extraordinary that we're in a national natural gas crisis in Europe, and yet they have flaring in North America because the gas is not worth keeping. They just burn it off, mm. and it's very polluting. But they're now taking that gas and using the energy to mine Bitcoin. So it's uh, proving to be a very green source of uh, energy. Well, that's uh, good, because uh, the, the Bitcoin does take up a lot we... of energy and is mm -hmm. causing global warming. You should so. have your own financial not... show on here, Don, where you like give out crypto tips and stuff. One of those like American style, buy now, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not very good at, at, at shilling, but it is really interesting the impact, the, 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 the use of wasted energy that Bitcoin does and how, I mean, because it's obviously essential, Eric, as I'm sure you know, <laughs> that we have a money that has a cost of production to it, because otherwise, as with the US dollar, one body has the uh, power to print money whenever they fancy it, and that gives that body disproportionate power uh, within a society, and that is why our Western societies are so disproportionately weighted towards large government, and there's not a, a fair balance between citizen and leader. You've written that books about this, Dom. I will defer to you, but I still think that Bitcoin's imaginary. <laughs> <laughs> There's no, it's, it's digital. I'll accept that, but it's uh, digital gold. It's the NFT of money. <laughs> it is no such thing. Right, uh, I bet you weren't expecting, dear viewer, to have Bitcoin shilled at you for two minutes, but that's what happens uh, when we run out of stories. <laughs> <laughs> and if uh, you need me to talk about anything, I can talk about Bitcoin. But uh, thank you very much to my guests, to Eric McElroy and to Nick Dixon. Um, they have been stalwarts, as always. Uh, thank you very much to you, uh, dear listener at home or whoever you're watching us. Join us again tomorrow. Headliners will be back at the same time. And Mark Dolan will be hosting. Until then, cheerio. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it's certainly...